Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you so much. As we gather for worship today, ask that you would imprint on our heart and on our mind, especially this promise that you have for us. You say to each and every one of us individually, speaking into our eyes and into our hearts, this promise you say, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Lord, help us to trust in your promise. We pray this in your powerful and saving name, Jesus. Amen. Three months ago this weekend, a mother and father, their adult children, and their grandchildren were all vacationing in a rented home in the woods in central Wisconsin. The day began early as the grandkids got up and went swimming in the pool that was in the backyard. It was a day full of fun and food and games and relaxation and conversation. It was fantastic. Then later that night, as they went to bed, some families in there went to their part of the house, and, and some cousins decided to sleep together with their cousins and, and everything. Some, some went to bed early, some went to bed late. It had been a great day. But somewhere, sometime, in the middle of the night, tragedy struck. A fire. A, a fire not out in the woods, but in the house, a house fire. The, the next minute or two, if that long, was filled with chaos. There was screaming, there was yelling, there was smoke, there were flames, there was fire, there was heat, there were escape attempts. Some were successful and some were not. The house burned to the ground. That night, six people died. From ages toddler to grandfather. Some of us knew some of them. Some of us knew all of them. It's horrible. Author and theologian Lee Strobel conducted a scientific poll of Americans. And, and one of the questions in the poll was, is if you could ask God any question and he would give you the answer right away, what would that question be? And by far and away, the number one question was, why does God allow suffering and pain? Today, as we conclude our series, Asking for a Friend, that's the question that's before us. How come bad things happen to good people? Or as the poll asks, why does God allow pain and suffering? Or, or maybe to the point for you and me, where is God when I'm suffering? Scripturally speaking, we know that God is all good, all loving, all powerful, all knowing, and yet evil exists. How's that work since he created everything? Well, in creation, God made everything, and after each day he said, it, it's good. It's good, and, until he got to the end of creation. And then he said, it's very good. God, being a, a God of love, wanted the crown of his creation, human beings to love him, and so he created them with free will. 
the ability to choose or not to choose, the, the ability to listen or not to listen, the, uh, the ability to love or not to love. Because you see, love requires a choice. You choose to love or you choose not to love. And so human beings could put this free will into practice. God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only tree in the entire world that Adam and Eve were directed by God not to eat from, or it would change everything and there would be death. Some of you know about this. This is from Genesis chapter 3. Satan is talking here, and he said, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Adam and Eve were were created to live for all eternity in bliss and in joy. They had been warned that if you eat from this tree, it will shatter all that. It will change all of that. But they did it anyway. And with that fruit still in their mouth, it was at that very moment that they knew they had messed up. Pain and suffering, bad and evil, and even death. It would be bad enough if that were just going to be the case for Adam and Eve. But when they did that, it corrupted their natures. And so as, as they had children, it just passed from one generation on to the other. They had made a choice to go away from God, a a choice to to love something or someone more than God, and they brought evil into the world. And now we often do the very same thing. We choose bad and evil sometimes. We're responsible for the bad and evil that we've brought into the world. And so if God were to do away with all the evil, you understand what that means then. He would have to do away with us. Into this sinful world, Jesus comes and he gives you and me two promises. The first promise is this. In this world, you will have trouble. Second promise. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So in this bad and evil, pain and suffering world, understand Jesus isn't sitting idly by. God is a God of love, and God is all good, and God is all powerful, and God is at work. Even through and in pain and suffering. Maybe you can think of it this way. You understand sometimes, sometimes the reason why we get a stomach ache is because we're hungry. We want food. We want something good. And so when we're going through life and there's pain and suffering and there's bad and evil, that's pointing us to something. We want something good. We want a savior from the suffering and the pain and the hurt and the bad and the evil and death. 
Scripture says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, God brings good through suffering by showing our need for a Savior. I happen to know a college basketball coach who, who was taking her team through some preseason workouts. Okay? This workout, the, the theme of the day was running. Okay? And so they ran. The basketball team wasn't even in the gym. They were outside on the track. The theme of the day was running, and they ran, and they ran some more, and they ran some more. It wasn't that the coach had lost her marbles. See, that, that whole workout was about character building and strength and endurance. Some of us today are running. It's about spiritual character development and strength and endurance. You, you see, the, the, the point of our lives isn't to become comfortable in a sinful world. The point of our lives is to be connected with God and eternity. See, the, the point of our lives isn't to be able to, to make it into a, an Ivy League school. That's fine if it happens, but it's not the point. The, the point of our lives isn't to make the sports team. It's, it's cool if it happens, but that's not the point. The, the point of our lives isn't to become a millionaire. It's okay if you are or you aren't or, or whatever, but that's not the point. The, the point is for you and me to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to remain in faith, and to share Jesus with others. And sometimes that involves running. Suffering. Romans 5 says this. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God brings good through suffering by building our spiritual character through endurance. Where's God when I'm suffering? He's working. He's, he's working to make all things come out for good. We may not be able to see it right away, in fact, if I asked you to raise your hand, have you been able to see it? <laughs> You'd be, no, the hands go up all over the place. We may not be able to understand it, but that doesn't mean he's not working. This is what Jesus told his original disciples when they're up in that upper room on that Monday Thursday night when he's washing their feet, when they're about to celebrate the Passover, when Jesus is about to go out and pray for his life, when Jesus is about to be arrested, put on a crazy trial, crucified and died. That's the context of when he says this to his disciples. You do not realize now what I'm doing but later, later, you'll understand. Sometimes the, the later's in heaven. See, sometimes we have to walk around the walls of Jericho. Sometimes we have to walk around the walls of Jericho six or seven times. God is working. You see, while you are waiting and wondering, God is working. 
our greatest disappointments, our greatest delusions, those things that, that shake us, those things that, that make us question everything that's going on. Is it worth it? Even in those things, we have hope. You don't, you don't have to live like there's no hope because there is hope. Remember what the scripture says about faith? It says faith is being sure of what we hope for and, and certain of what we do not see. See, faith it means trusting God even when you don't have it all figured out. In the book of James, the apostle says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-good God is at work making everything work for good. Romans 8 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I know that can be hard to grab onto. That that can be hard to believe that, that God is working through this for the good. But it's true. Here's the proof. Jesus suffered. See, Jesus doesn't just understand suffering because he's read about it or something. No, Jesus understands it because he went through it. And he was literally the only good person, right, that ever lived. And yet he suffered. He suffered deeply. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus wasn't like, okay, well, let, let's, let's watch something else on TV. He cried. He was broken. Jesus knows what it's like to be abused physically and emotionally. The leaders of the church of his day, the ones who ought to have been his ardent supporters, they didn't see Jesus and go, look, the Son of God. They looked at Jesus and they said, look, Satan, stay away from him. Oh, how the disappointment and disillusionment, the, the feeling like the, the plans were tanking must have been overflowing. The people that Jesus came to, to love and to save, they despised and rejected him. Some of you know the, the passage from Isaiah 53 that, that prophesied about what it was going to be like to be Jesus. It says this, he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, understand that the, the suffering, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus reveals 
God's nature of love in no way that human wisdom would have ever come up with. Understand that the, the suffering and death of Jesus reveals that God is at work for the good even in the very worst. See, when the disciples saw Jesus being crucified and when they, they saw him die, they, they could not fathom in any way, shape, or form that this was going to be a good thing. This was horrible. They were crushed. They were devastated. They were in the land of no hope. They couldn't see it. But God could and did. See, what, what appeared to be the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world ends up being the best thing that ever happened in the history of the world. Again, no way could those original disciples foresee that, but God saw, God saw that through Jesus' innocent suffering and death that you and I would have a Savior from sin. Our sins would be paid for. We could be reconciled to God, and then we could be reunited in God in heaven, whereas the Scripture says in heaven, not here on earth, in heaven there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. No more broken circumstances. No more broken hearts. No more trashed dreams. No more shattered realities. I, like you, know what it's like to suffer. And, and when we suffer, individually, this isn't so much a philosophical issue. This is a personal issue. And we want a personal response. Where are you, God? When I'm suffering. I know about cloudy days. And I know you do, too. And, and when we think about things, you know, like let's say it's a, it's a November day. It's two in the afternoon. What, and it's cloudy. And those November clouds right there is gray and dark. And they cover the sky and we, we can't see the sun shining. We can't see the sun at all. But you know, the sun is still there. So also when we go through the cloudy days of suffering, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is still shining. Where, where is Jesus at in our cloudy days? Where is Jesus at in our suffering? Psalm 34 tells us, says, God is close to the brokenhearted, close to those crushed in spirit. Jesus, when you're suffering, is suffering right along with you. See, Jesus didn't just suffer for us on the cross. 
He suffers with us now. When we suffer, he suffers. When we cry, he cries. He's right beside us. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Right beside us. When you are suffering from, fill in that blank. Jesus is right there, sitting beside you in the toughest of times. It reminded me of, of Pooh and Piglet, right? Remember when Pooh had that really bad day and he, he didn't even want to talk about it and, and Piglet's following him around and Pooh's like, what are you doing? He said, I'm just going to be with you. Jesus is always with you. Where's God when I am suffering? He's right beside you suffering with you. So here's some take-homes for you. In the midst of suffering, when you're tempted to believe there's no way that this is going to work out, when you're questioning everything, when you feel like giving up, When you you say to yourself, you don't have the strength to go on. Remember, it's God's strength that helps you go on, not yours. So don't you dare give up. Remember, Jesus is greater than our suffering. Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves, proves he is greater than our suffering and then even death. Some of us, as, as we're worshiping today, we're, we're, we're holding on to hurt because it hurts so badly. We're going to God, but we're struggling to let go of the hurt. I want you, it's okay. God is big enough to hold you and your hurt at the same time. Remember, God is holding you. Here's an illustration that that hopefully will help. At at the bottom of the stick is all our, our hurt and our suffering. And at the top of the stick is Jesus. When you and I go through life, Looking at the bottom, at the hurt and the suffering, it's so hard to stay steady. But when you and I look up at the cross, up at the top, when you and I look at Jesus, it's so much easier. Focus on Jesus, not the pain. Focus on Jesus not the struggle. Focus on Jesus, not the hurt. Focus on Jesus, not the trial. Remember, focus on Jesus. One last thing. The word compassion means to carry someone else's burden. 
The, the thing that is probably the, the greatest teacher of compassion is suffering. We don't just then hear of other people's problems and issues and, and pains. We, we understand when we've gone through it. And, and so as Scripture says, when, when we've had that, that suffering, then we're able to, to weep with those who weep. We get it. See, when we allow our suffering to be as a way to show empathy to others, we find that, that suffering is not only a, a burden to carry, but a way to help out. It's been said that friendship cuts the pain in half and doubles the joy. Suffering. It's tough. But remember, God is working. God is with you. And God is greater than everything. Jesus promised, in this world, you'll have trouble. Take heart. I've overcome the world. So let's pray. We pray to our Heavenly Father, Dad, I, I know you can do anything. All things are possible for you. I know you could take care of this situation. I know you could keep me out of this suffering. I know you could take away the pain instantly. Dad, you're so powerful. Please give me what I ask. Take away the pain and suffering. You see my hurt, and I know you care, and I know you're with me, and I know you will answer my prayer. Please don't let this pain be my burden any longer. Dad, I don't want to go through this suffering. But what I want most is your will. More than anything, I want your plan, your purpose, and your perspective. Please do your will in my life even if it means I have to bear this pain. I know you'll be with me and help me and make me more like you and receive me into your heavenly home. We pray this in our Savior's Jesus' name. Amen.